page 129, principle number five, uh, which says this, small compromises lead to great disaster. So we're looking at our 10 principles. This is chapter 10 in our books. And um, one of the things we've talked about is this. Um, we're talking about our freedom through Jesus Christ. It's great to have that word, freedom. And when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, um, the Bible tells us this, that, um, that Jesus Christ, He sets you free from the power of sin. Now, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, here in this uh, verse that we're looking at in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. And what this was actually talking about, uh, uh, when Paul was writing this to the people of uh, Galatia, they were thinking that they had to do, do, do something, and, and people kept thinking, it feels so easy to get saved. <laughs> Just put your faith in Jesus. And they kept thinking, I, there must be something I have to do. And there's people that kept coming up with maybe things you had to do. And they think, well, we better do this or we better do that. And, 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 and he's telling them, encourage them, stand fast in your liberty. Know that, uh, that you know, if Jesus has set you free, don't try to stand on anything else to get you to heaven other than Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes people uh, almost feel like, you know what, they're, they're trusting Jesus about 95% of the way. But they keep thinking, maybe there's something I have to do to get myself to heaven. No, it's all by God and His grace. Because the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, if someone gives you a gift, you have to accept that gift and, um, and, and not try to pay part of it. Uh, you might say... Um, it's a gift, and the Bible says if we, if we got to heaven someday and we earned some of it, the Bible says we would boast about it. Well, why would you get here? I had perfect attendance in church. Oh, really? Wow, that's really great. <laughs> and I got sick one Sunday, so I'm a, what, second class in heaven? No. That wouldn't be fair, would it? Um, you, and someone, you know, got to heaven, they could boast about it. No, we have to say it's all because of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. It's a free gift. He saves us. He takes away our sins. But then what he does, he sets us free. Now, in other words, um, as a Christian, you think, boy, this is great. I've been set free from sin. And uh, what am I going to do with that freedom? Well, uh, here's, here's, the, here's the thing. Um, you know, if you look north, south, east, or west, whatever directions you want to go, and you think, what do I want to do with my life? And the thing we don't want to do is go back to our sinful life. That's the one direction we don't want to go. And that's what this second verse up here says, Brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but to love and to serve one another. You've been set free. Don't run back to the problem. Don't run back to your sin. That's the one direction you don't want to go. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to set up some boundaries in your life. And you need to set up these personal boundaries. See, each of these principles are boundaries you need to decide. Now, I can talk about them. I can jump up and down and scream about them even. We can show videos about them. We can show illustrations. But you've got to make them personal and say, I want to do this. I want to make these principles my principles because I believe in them. I believe they're based on the Bible and I want to do them. Now, uh, so principle number five, um, small compromises lead to great disasters. Now, we use this phrase, little sins lead to big sins. Now, obviously we know that in the eyes of God, there's no such thing as a little sin. In fact, uh, the very first sin in the Bible, the, God made one rule. He said, you can't eat of this particular tree. It's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, you can eat all the other trees of the garden. He said this to Adam. He said, any other tree you can eat of it. But he said, one tree you can't eat of. Now, you could, you could look in, in one perspective and say, you know what? That seems like such a minor offense. Taking a piece of fruit. Uh, you know, and you might think of it maybe as a kid if you're at grandma's house and, and uh, grandma's cooking dinner and, and mom's rule is no, no treats before dinner, you know, and grandma says, oh, here, just have a cookie, you know. And you think, you know, that's not that big a deal. Uh, you know, it's just a minor offense. And somebody might look at the eating of the tree in the Garden of Eden. They think that's a, just, a, just a minor offense. They took a piece of fruit. But what you have to look at it from God's perspective, he makes a rule and you rebel against that rule. God makes a rule and says this is sacred and they violate what God has set apart as sacred, as, as separate and say don't touch it. 
And when God has decided, I have made the rules, I am the authority, and you say, you know what? I don't care about your authority, God. I want to do what I want to do. We're almost making ourselves the God of our lives. Now, if you were looking at that perspective, you think, boy, that is a big offense. <laughs> That's pretty bad. Now, here's what happens in our lives. We like to look at everything we do as small things. In fact, sometimes we convince ourselves <laughs> that what we did was okay, and sometimes we even convince ourselves that uh, it was actually a good thing that we did. Um, now, hopefully, you don't have a problem with anger, but uh, perhaps uh, somebody has offended you in some way. You've gotten angry, you've gotten bitterness in your heart, and for whatever reason, you've decided you're going to get back at that person, and you're going to try to hurt them. And sometimes we feel good in ourselves because, you know what, good, I'm glad that got them back. <laughs> I'm glad I hurt them. I'm glad that they felt the pain I felt. And so we feel like, you know what? We justified our sin. We justified the reason why we hurt somebody else because they hurt us. And sometimes we, we, we make it feel like that wasn't even a problem. It wasn't even a sin. Um, uh, one of the reasons we need to hear the word of God preached to us is because sometimes our sins are not obvious to us. Sometimes our sins, um, I, I, I call it the barbecue sauce on your face effect. You know, if you've ever eaten uh, uh, barbecue chicken and, and you ever got, uh, you know, like a chicken wing or something gets on your fingers, gets on your face. And once in a while, you might not see it because it's so close to your face, you cannot see it. And everybody else seems to take notice of it. Oh boy, doesn't he realize there's barbecue sauce on his face? And you're walking around and, you know, shaking people's hands. And Man, doesn't he see this? And finally, somebody has to tell you, hey, listen, you know, there's something on your face. Why don't you take a napkin and wipe it off? Oh, Oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, I feel so embarrassed. You know, it's amazing to me that that's why we need the Word of God preached. That's why we need someone to tell us, because sometimes our sins are so close to us. Sometimes our sins seem so uh, oblivious to ourselves. We don't realize we're involved with sin, but, you know, sometimes it's obvious to everybody else. And yet they're thinking, why don't they just do this? Why don't they just stop doing that? Why don't they start doing this? And it seems small, it seems um, insignificant to us. Now, here's a warning in Matthew chapter 5 uh, about, you might say, Jesus says this. He says, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men to do so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. You know, this is a, uh, a, a, a very uh, strong words to someone like myself who's a pastor. Someone like myself who's teaching the word of God. You know, sometimes... Um, as you're going through the Word of God, uh, sometimes uh, I don't uh, maybe always understand everything. Sometimes uh, I've made mistakes. I've taught somebody something, and then later I've studied the Word of God some more. I thought, oh, man, I don't think I taught that correctly. I think I have a better understanding today. Now, that happens sometimes where I make mistakes. Sometimes I, I, I don't understand the Word of God, and later I, I grow, and I, I learn more about a passage. But if I know something to be true... And I purposely teach someone a lie and purposely teach someone the wrong thing. The Bible says someone that would do that as a Bible teacher would be called least in the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's uh, because you're not only, uh, uh, you might say, not obeying the word of God. You're telling other people something that's not true and encouraging them not to do what God said. That's a scary offense. And it's important that when we find something in the word of God and we read it, it doesn't matter how small or insignificant it seems to us. If God said it, and it's important to God, then we need to do it. And if we compromise and we think in our head, oh, that's not that important, that's not that big a deal, we convince ourselves it's okay, it's going to lead, as we said, to, to great disasters. Now, uh, thinking about that, um, one of the biggest disasters most people are familiar with is the sinking of the Titanic. A horrible uh, event that even, it's been, I think, over 100 years since it happened. Uh, and people still talk about it. There's still books about it, movies made about it, and people talking about this event. Uh, but there was many factors that led to the sinking of the Titanic. Many mistakes that were made, many unforeseen factors. But one of the things that they say was a major factor in what took place in the sinking of the Titanic is they did not have access to binoculars. And, of course, uh, uh, they had, uh, you can see, you can't see the whole thing, but there's that pole on the front of the boat there in my picture, and uh, apparently there's a couple lookouts, uh, it looks like halfway up there there's maybe a spot where men would stand, 
Perhaps there was even a higher one up at the top. I'm not sure. This is just an artistic representation. But anyhow, somebody would be watching with a pair of binoculars. But at the last minute before they were boarding the ship, there was a change in, in uh, command. And apparently, from what I understand, the binoculars were actually on the ship, but they didn't have a key to the box to open them because the man that had the key uh, didn't give it to the next person as he was boarding the ship as this change of command. One little tiny key to open a box to get out this other little item, these binoculars, so somebody could look out and keep a watch so they would have plenty of advance notice. Obviously a big ship, you can't just make a hairpin turn at the last minute. You have to have plenty of warning and be able to see far out ahead to see where the icebergs are. And so one little key and one little set of binoculars could have been something that led to a great disaster. Jack, do you have a comment on that? Yeah. The key was to the doctor was the one thing. The other thing, the mistake they made was they turned the ship. I just saw a thing that said if they would have hit the iceberg straight on, mm. the Titanic would have never sank because it was designed to be able to get it from the front. Front, not from the side. So little things, little mistakes, and, uh, and one little turn, one little key, one little set of binoculars, and a whole ship and, th and uh, over a thousand people lost their lives because of tiny mistakes. Now, in our lives, I believe this principle is true, that often big disasters smart start with, with a small compromise. Now, uh, uh, in our video earlier, uh, he already talked about uh, this story, but I'll talk about it from a little bit different angle a little bit different aspect. He talked about King David. In 1 Kings chapter 11, uh, the Bible tells us that there was a time when kings go forth to war. Now, uh, I often question and wonder about that verse. Why was it necessary for people to just suddenly go out to battle and suddenly go out to war? But this seemed like the expected thing that David should have gone out in this battle. Now, you have to remember, David has now been the king and he has waited for a long time to be king. In fact, he's, he's, he's fought as a soldier many times. He's gone out in many battles and many wars. And in fact, David had a desire to build a temple, but God said, you've been in too many battles. You've shed too much blood. I cannot allow you to be, uh, be the one to build my temple because of that. So David was a warrior. In fact, one of the stories we're familiar with is, is David killing Goliath in his younger years when he was just a boy. And, and so David was known as a great warrior. Now, perhaps, though, you think about sometimes when we know, you might say, where our strengths are, and we know um, uh, maybe where our weaknesses are, but David, for whatever reason, thought, you know, it wasn't necessary for him to go to battle. And he decided he appointed this other man, Joab, to go out to the battle in his place to lead the army, and he didn't feel it was necessary for him to go. Now, uh, but the Bible tells us this, David tarried still at Jerusalem. He decided to take some rest. He decided to take it easy and not go out to this battle. Now, I would like to kind of relate that in our Christian lives. You might say to sometimes in our Christian lives, what we, we try to do is we try to rely on, you might say, the victories of the past or the knowledge of the past. Or you might say uh, what our growth in the past, we try to rely on that for today. And see, what happens sometimes in our lives as we do this, we, we think, you know what? I have a lot of knowledge about the Bible. And what happens is it comes to the, day, the time of the day when you say, you know what? I know I should read my Bible. I know I should spend time reading God's Word today. I know I should fellowship with God. But we think, you know what? I have a lot of Bible knowledge. It's all in my head. I know these things. I've read this part of the Bible in the past. Is it really necessary for me to, to spend time in the Word of God today? And that's often the place where people make the first compromise, is not having a time with God in a, their personal life, not spending time personally reading the Word of God in their devotion life. And why do they do that? They think, I can rely on what's been done in the past. And David, as I said, had won some great victories in the past. He had, he had killed Goliath. He had, you might say, uh, fought many, many battles in the past. And you know what? You think about it, he may have lifted himself up with pride and thought, you know what? I don't need to go to this battle. I don't need to fight this battle today. And you know what? That's often the one thing that gets in our lives is the idea of pride. 
we allow ourselves to somehow look at something like, I don't need to do this. Here's what happens sometimes in our RU program or in our Christian lives in church is people begin to develop a relationship with God and they start to grow. They start to make good decisions. You start to, you might say, um, allow your Christian life to squeeze out the, the flesh life and you stop doing the things, the behaviors you were doing before and you start living for God. And you know what happens sometimes? We start to think that we're doing it in our own strength and our own power. And the very things that we should be dependent on, reading our Bible and going to church and praying and, and having a relationship with God and being around other Christians and building a relationship with them, the things that we are relying on to continue that Christian life, we start to think, you know what, I don't think it's that necessary anymore. And we start to, you might say, just slack off a little because we feel like, uh, you know, I've kind of arrived at some place. And David had, had waited, waited many, many years to become king. In fact, King Saul, if you remember, had thrown that javelin at David and tried to kill him at one point. And David had run uh, from, uh, from King Saul for many years and had to be in hiding and had even had to go to the enemy country of the Philistines where Goliath had been from. He even had to flee there because he was so afraid of King Saul for a while. But now he'd finally arrived at being king. And that's when he thought, maybe I can just slack off, I can just take a break. You know, one of the lies that I believe Satan tries to convince us of is, boy, you're going a little bit overboard here, aren't you? And if you kind of picture your Christian life like some walls around your life, like a big fence, a big gate, and you might say the best thing to do is build these gates and these walls as high as you can. And, and you know, if you ever think about uh, somebody that bolts their door at night, uh, have you ever seen people that's got deadbolt, deadbolt, deadbolt lock, you know, deadbolt, they got a whole bunch of padlocks and deadbolts to try to keep people out of their house at night and somebody says why do you have so many deadbolts you know I'm protecting my house and somebody else you know um, you, you go to some some areas and you see even places where people put metal work over their windows to keep people out of their house at night and somebody says boy you're going a little bit overboard aren't you you're, you're going a little bit too hard and you think about your life and and you almost like have this patrol around your life all right I'm, I'm gonna march around the wall and make sure there's not a place for a mouse to crawl under this wall you know I'm going to guard my life. I'm protecting it. I'm making sure I'm praying every day. I'm reading my Bible. And, and you know what Satan kind of comes along and does? He looks at this big wall you've built up of protection, of making sure, you're, buddy, I'm going to be in my Bible every day. I'm going, to read, uh, you know, I'm going to be in church every Sunday. I'm going to be at RU all the time. I'm going to be doing everything I need to do. And Satan just kind of looks and says, oh, boy, you've really gone overboard here, haven't you? <laughs> Almost makes you feel foolish for all the things you're doing. And, and you kind of think, well, <laughs> Yeah, I guess I kind of went a little overboard here. It's like, you don't need to do all that. Satan kind of convinces us, I'm not even attacking you anymore. Look, we, I've kind of, you're, you're doing so great, kind of pat you on the back and says, boy, I'm not saying Satan's physically patting you on the back. I'm just saying Satan wants to make you feel like you're doing such a great job that you can let your guard down a little bit. You can lower the uh, walls a little bit. You can uh, not lock quite so many locks. You can just kind of, you might say, why don't you just leave the door open once in a while? Why don't you leave the windows open at night? Why don't you, you know, leave the door open a crack and not lock it? You know, why don't you um, not be so protective of your life, of your Christian life? You don't have to read your Bible every day. You don't have to spend so much time in prayer. Is it really necessary to be at every service of the church? Is it really necessary to be at RU every Friday night? And you start thinking, I guess, you know, I am doing pretty good. And we start patting ourselves on the back. Boy, I really am pretty good at this Christian life thing. I really am uh, winning some victories here. And what Satan wants to do is he wants to get you to just compromise a little. Leave the gate open, leave the door open, leave the window open. And Satan, like a roaring lion, wants to come in and attack. He just needs the door open once. He just needs you to let your guard down for a little bit. And he wants to convince you, it's okay, I'm never going to attack. What have you noticed? Have you ever seen the lions out in the jungle? That big lion, he just sits there and he looks like a big kitty cat, doesn't he? He looks like you could just go over there and pet him and just, and, 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 but you know, they're a lot like the house cats that we have. Have you ever seen a cat? They'll sit there and they'll watch a mouse run back and forth and that mouse starts to get a little bit comfortable with that cat. The mouse thinks that cat's not going to attack me and that cat sits there and sits there and all of a sudden, what's that cat do? It pounces, doesn't it? It jumps on that mouse. And that's exactly what Satan is. He's a roaring lion. He's just, all of a sudden, he's going to wait till your guard's down, wait till you're not paying attention and boom, he's going to attack. Anybody still sleeping? All right. I'll try to keep you awake tonight. Now, listen. 
That's the place that we, we get to in our lives. We compromise just a little bit and we let our guard down. That's what David did. And of course, we already heard the story earlier of what happened. David lets his guard down. He sins with Bathsheba. Later, Bathsheba was married. His, uh, her husband uh, was fighting in the battle with this man, Joab, that David had appointed to go lead the battle. And David writes a letter to Joab and says, why don't you send Uriah out to the very front of the battle? And, da- and Joab, or excuse me, Uriah was very loyal to his country. He was very, very loyal to King David. And he went out and fought in the battle, and the whole rest of the army stepped back and let this man get killed in battle. David gave the orders. David murdered this man, Uriah. David was the sweet psalmist of Israel. He had wrote psalms, and we have those psalms written in our Bible. He had been, you know, he was a a song leader in God's house, singing praise to God. He was a leader of the nation. People looked to David as a great spiritual leader, but he let his guard down. He compromised, and he sinned. Don't think it can't happen to you. Don't let Satan convince you that you can let your guard down. You've got to stay doing the little things every day. Now, I'd like to think about um, a different aspect here. Luke 16.10 uh, says this, He that is faithful or consistent in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. You know, um, uh, sometimes, and I'm not necessarily focused on this, some people might tell you this, make your bed every day. <laughs> Now, like I said, that's up to you. I don't care uh, whether you make your bed or not. But sometimes people say, is it really that big a deal to make your bed? I'm just going to sleep in it the next night. Um, That's up to you. I'm not not focused on that. But obviously making your bed is a, a little thing. But what happens in our lives is little things, you might say, become big things. And the Bible tells us that if we want to be faithful in the big things, we've got to be faithful in the little things. Now, here's where it matters if if you were living at home and your mom tells you, she said to you, make your bed. And you thought, you know what? That doesn't seem that important to me to obey my parents. See, the Bible says children obey your parents for this is right. And uh, so if, if your parents told you to do something and you didn't obey it because you thought that doesn't matter, that's where it becomes a problem. Now, um, here's, here's the thing, though. When God says something in his word, sometimes we look at it and we think, eh, you know what, I'm going to focus on the big things right now. I can't focus on all these commandments in the Bible. There's just so many of them. I'm just going to have to skip that one. Even though God's convicting my heart, even though I know God's word says it clearly, I just can't focus on that right now. That's, that's not that important. Well, it is. <laughs> if God said it's important. And what happens in our lives is sometimes God gives us small responsibilities. God gives us small things to do, and you say, oh, God, you know, this is not that big a deal. I want something big. If, if you told me to go to the mission field, I'd go. If you told me, you know, to, 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 to you know, take an airplane and, and, and uh, give food to a whole country, I, I, I'd fly that airplane, and, you know, and I'd do whatever you want. You, you think all these big things you'd do for God. And God says, I want you to get out of bed and go to church today. <laughs> oh, well, boy, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> I want you to open your Bible and read it. Oh, boy, that's, that's a tough one. You know, we have trouble doing the little things. And we keep wanting and say, God, I'll, I'll go to the ends of the earth. I'll go to the, the darkest tribes where they've never heard the gospel, and they've got headhunters there that are going to kill me and eat me, and I'll go there. Yeah, but we won't get down on our knees and pray. Where's the problem? We're not being faithful in the little things And we're complaining because God won't give us big things to do. The Bible says we have to be faithful in the little things. Be faithful in that which is least. Things that you might not even think matter aren't that big a deal. Be faithful in them. Do the things God wants you to do. And then you can be uh, victorious in the big things. Um, When I think about being faithful in the little things, I think about a story in the Bible about a little boy who brought his lunch. Now, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, in the morning, one of the things I do, I, I, I work in carpentry, and sometimes I, I, I have to make sure when I get up in the morning, I have to pack a lunch. And, and I don't know, well, for whatever reason, it just seems painfully hard to spread mayonnaise on a piece of bread in the morning. I don't know why it is. It's just sometimes I just like, oh, I've got to make a sandwich. Oh, it seems hard. <laughs> you know, but if I get out there on the job and I think, you know, I've got to eat something, it's, I'm glad I packed my sandwich. I'm glad I packed my lunch. 
It's just something little, just, just packing a lunch, making sure you have some food for later in the day. Now, there was 5,000 people gathered to hear Jesus one day, and that was just the men because the Bible says there's women and children as well, so there's a big crowd, maybe 10 to 15,000 people, and only one boy <laughs> packed a lunch. Now, you might think packing a lunch, that's just a small thing. It's not a big deal. But on this particular day, it was very, very important, wasn't it? It was very important that this boy was smart enough and intelligent enough. And maybe his mother was the one that before he left the house, she said, you need to put something in a box and take it with you. Oh, Mom, I don't have time for that. I've got to go hear Jesus preach. You know, he's just, I've got to get out the door. Everybody's running to hear Jesus. I'm going to miss it. She says, you're going to pack your lunch. <laughs> Fine. Oh, man, everybody's leaving. You're throwing stuff in a box. And then he gets out there. And Jesus says, did anybody bring any food? <laughs> and he's probably expecting, probably a lot of people uh, showed up with their lunch. And they said, we got one boy that remembered to pack a lunch. Oh, boy. <laughs> I guess it was important. It's a small thing, wasn't it? He packed, and, and even when the Bible talks about it, it says, uh, you know, he has a couple of barley loaves. Barley was the cheapest of the grains or the... the uh, the poorest, if you, if you didn't have much money, you ate barley as compared to the other wheats and corns and so forth. And the Bible says, and, and some small fish, <laughs> probably the other fishermen would have been thought like, you know, these are the ones we throw back or these are the ones we use for bait. And they're like, boy, this isn't much of a lunch. And they, but they brought it to Jesus, didn't they? And Jesus blessed it and he broke it and he multiplied it and he fed 5,000 people with just a small lunch. Are little things important? Sometimes they are, aren't they? Now what I want to encourage you to do is be right in your place doing exactly what you need to be. You'd be surprised. And here's the thing. Some days we go through and you think, you know what? I don't know if it mattered all the little things that I did. You don't know what big disasters you might have avoided because you did the little things. You know, um, if, if, if that man that we talked about earlier, the binoculars on the Titanic, we don't know for certain. We can't speculate on what could have happened, but if somebody had given him the key and he had had the binoculars and he could look out, we might never even have heard about the Titanic today. It might just be a, a ship that sailed back and forth across the ocean and wasn't that big a deal in history because somebody actually did what they were supposed to do. You don't realize sometimes the disasters you might be avoiding by doing the little things. By praying, you might not realize the big problems you might be running into and facing that by praying that morning you avoided those big disasters because you asked God to direct your steps. By reading your Bibles, God gave you wisdom as how to make decisions so your life didn't end up in disaster. The little decisions matter. We need to be faithful in the small things. If you, uh, number two here, if you're not yielding yourself to the little request of God, you will yield yourself to the little request of the enemy. Uh, Romans 6, 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin of to death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you're not committed to God, if you're not yielding to God and obeying to God, who are you obeying? Well, who are you obeying, David? You're obeying the enemy. You're obeying the enemy, are you? You're obeying Satan. You're obeying, you might say, your own sinful flesh, too. You're not obeying God. You're, you're obeying um, what you want and what Satan wants you to do. So you're not following God. Who are you yielding to? Um, another story I was thinking of in the Bible is a man by the name of Peter. Peter was gathered with the other disciples in the upper room, and Jesus had told them that he was going to be, uh, be uh, betrayed, and he was going to go to the cross and be crucified. He told them of someone that would betray him. That was, that was Judas. Judas had left already. But he looked at Peter, and he told Peter, he said, Tonight, Peter, you are going to deny me three times that you even know me. Peter said, you know what? He said, if everybody else in this room denies you, he said, I'm not going to deny you. That night, some men came with Judas and they took Jesus. They led him away. Peter actually tried to stand for Jesus and cut off somebody's ear, maybe trying to take off their head. Jesus said, put away your sword, Peter. And somehow during the night, Jesus got separated from the disciples. And, and the Bible tells this about Peter. Peter continued to follow Jesus. But what did he do? He followed afar off. Now, if you want to know where did Peter make his mistake, think about this. He was still following Jesus, wasn't he? But he just stepped back a little bit because Jesus was being, you know, captured by these armed men and 
being taken away to trial, and he just said, you know what? I'm going to keep following you, but I'm just going to step back just a little bit so people don't realize that I'm with you in case everybody's getting arrested tonight. I don't want to be in the group that's getting arrested. He just stepped back a little bit. See, he was still in the right direction. He's still following Jesus, isn't he? His direction is right, but his distance is wrong. He just took a step back. Well, later that night, uh, he's further away from Jesus. Jesus is standing in trial, but he's still in eyesight of Jesus. But as they're standing there around the fire, people uh, see the lights of the fire, and if someone throws a log on, you probably see people's faces. And as they look at Peter's face, one, somebody says, you know, you were with Jesus, weren't you? And Peter says, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't, I don't know anything about that man. I'm summarizing. That's not a direct quote from the Bible. And, and somebody else says the same thing. Even a little child looks and says, yes, I recognize you. You were with Jesus. And they recognize his speech. They recognize the way he talks. And they say, you're from Galilee. I know you're a Galilee. And I know you're a follower of Jesus. And that night, Peter even began to curse and to swear, the Bible says. And vehemently, just, just absolutely deny that he knew Jesus. And this is the very moment that Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross and bleed and die. And at that moment, the Bible says it was, it was all the way through the night. The sun was coming up and the, the, the rooster would crow. Just at that moment, he would look over at Jesus and realize, I did exactly what Jesus said I would do. I denied him. Where did the problem start, do you think? In one night, he went from saying, I'll never deny you. In, that, in, in 20, less than 24 hours, he was denying that he knew Jesus. What happened? He just, he just stepped back a little bit. And I will tell you, I, it's so important that you realize, don't stop doing what God needs you to do. Don't step back. Don't, don't slouch and relax and think it's just not that important. It's not that big a deal if I don't read my Bible. It's not that big a deal if I miss one church service. Don't think that you can do this in your own strength, and your own power, and think, I've got this like we're riding a bike and coasting, and we can just stop pedaling, and I've just got it from here. It's going to be okay. It's not. You've got to keep doing No matter how far you've come in your Christian life, you cannot let your guard down. You cannot stop doing the things God needs you to do. Commit to do the little things every day. James 4, 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good... And doeth it not to him and his sin. You know, one of the things that I think bothers me most is not my outward appearance to other people. It's the things that God convicts me of on the inside, and nobody else knows God's convicting me of. Nobody knows God's directing me to do something at that particular moment. And I can get away because nobody thinks I'm doing anything wrong. Nobody thinks I'm doing anything bad. But in my heart, I know I didn't do the thing God wanted me to do at that particular moment. And those are the things that later I feel the most convicted about because everybody else might think, well, he's doing everything right. But in my heart, I know I didn't do the thing God wanted me to do at that particular moment. If you know to do good and don't do it, it's sin. May God help us to do the little things we need to do every day. Dear Heavenly Father, God, help us to commit to you every day, every moment, every hour. Just commit to doing the things you want us to do. I pray, Lord, that you keep us in the Word, keep us our guard up and help us to be faithful doing those little things every day. In Jesus' name, amen.